the average temperature there during winter is about minus sixteen Celsius degree. Therefore, the guy in the ice hole would have his whole body numbed. But they didn't stop there. They'd pull him up and stretch out his fingers on the arm. Hello, everyone. I'm Min. Welcome to my channel. The stories of murders I have covered this, this, this are all from the northeast of China. As these many cases I have talked about, they either had a killer from the northeast or they were just simply happened there. Have you wondered what was wrong with this particular region of China? Northeast China or northeastern China is a geographical region of China. It usually corresponds specifically to the three provinces east of the Greater Qingyun region, namely Liaoning, Jilin, and Heilongjiang province, which you can see is the head of the China Chicken Map. And instead of telling you another murder case, I'm gonna tell you the case of Chao Si, which was the head of local notorious mafia. Please be advised that this video contains explicit descriptions of violence against pregnant individuals and depictions of disabilities. If you find such content disturbing and unacceptable, I kindly request that you exit this video. Some say he was a legend from a construction site porter and migrant worker to become a local tyrant, all by his own efforts and courage. He, in the past, stomped his feet the whole northeast three provinces with Chambo. When others were still jealous of the wealth who had tens of thousands of yuan, he had already joined the ranks of billionaires. He had over a thousand bodyguards, more than twenty branches brothers, and countless followers. He fought fiercely with the police countless times, forcing the government to dispatch armed police for a surprise operation to capture him. In the bitter cold wind and snow in Harbin in 1983, in a slum, more than a hundred freezed so-called holdouts were engaged in large-scale armed fighting with the demolition team. Holdout referred to a phenomenon in China where certain residents refused to relocate or negotiate during urban development or land exploration processes. China's rapid economic development has led to a situation where the existing urban planning cannot keep up with the demands of modernization. As a result, many major cities have initiated demolition and relocation projects. However, due to the lack of relevant compensation regulations by the central government in the past, the compensation amounts for demolitions in 1980s were not much coped with the reluctance of residents to be notified of their relocation, various social tragedies emerged, including the issue of holdouts. These residents stubbornly chose to stay in their homes, resulting in isolated houses that resemble nails sticking out from the ground, hence the term holdout was made. And it represents the resistance of these individuals against forced relocation or changes in their living conditions. As soon as they met face to face, they quickly entangled in a fire fight. The severely corroded wooden power poles broke with a sound under the impact, and the tottering, dangerous walls collapsed with a roar. Mr. X, the director of the demolition work, took out a handheld loudspeaker from his car and was about to make a speech when a flying break hit him in the head nearly smashing his head, so he could only step down and sigh deeply at home when recovering from the injury. Mr. X graduated from university and joined the government. He wanted to do good for the people. But it's either his luck or while well, he blinded to his luck and he couldn't kiss the ass of his boss. Therefore, he could not get any promotion at all and now he was assigned with the most difficult task, which was to deal with the holdouts. He was super duper frustrated though, he knew he could gain some favors if he could return a good result to his superiors. But he was somewhat devastated as he was hit by the holdouts. He felt their determinations. And while Mr. X was discouraged, this guy came out of nowhere but was introduced to him 
claiming that he could save the Hilda problem for him. Most importantly, this guy Chao Si said all he needed to pay was only ten yuan. Of course, Mr. X didn't believe him at first, as this guy looked strong though. He didn't give an impression of being very smart, is it? Anyway, Mr. X had run out of options. He brought this guy to visit the holdouts, just in the hope that miracle would take place and shine his light, and it did. In the following day, the holdouts circled Mr. X and his people as usual and prepared to have big fights, as they had done. On a daily basis, but before any physical conflicts had taken place, Chao Si, that mysterious guy, broke into a house and grabbed a knife from its kitchen to chop one of his fingers off. That's way too bloody. Everyone there got stunned. Chao Si shouted to the public, saying, "Only the people who could take off their fingers like him would stop him from demolishing the place." And I guess most people would choose their fingers and got the money, then move out of the area. Thus, the local violent forced evictions were initiated by him. Mr. X was overjoyed, holding a stack of forced eviction consent contracts in his hand. He immediately promised to cooperate with Chao Si on all future forced eviction matters. At this moment, Mr. X did not realize that in the next seven years, he would cultivate the nightmare of the entire Harbin all by himself. Chao Si was a nickname. His real names were Song Yong Jia. Born on the twenty-first of June, nineteen forty-eight, he was the fourth child of his family, and the family was living near to a bridge. Therefore, he gained this nickname as Chao Si, as "child" in Chinese was a bridge. Chao Si had been a nobody for his first thirty-five years. The first time he had tasted some more success was the time he chopped off his finger for Mr. X. He gained reputation when he completed this forced eviction task, and he loved it. He didn't like losing his finger, though. He loved to be respected, to be useful, to be needed, especially by an officer from an authority. His logic. I got some thoughts that could be it or not, but I'd like to share it with you anyway. People may perceive authorities as being authoritative for several reasons: the official status and power. Authorities typically represent the government, law, or power institutions. They hold specific positions and power to establish regulations, enact policies, and enforce laws. These official status gives them a symbol of authority, social trust, and recognition. Authorities are generally seen as a source of authority because they are believed to possess expertise, experience, and knowledge. Their decisions and guidance are often based on legal, scientific, and policy knowledge, making them reliable and trustworthy. Maintaining social order and stability. One of the responsibilities of authority is to uphold social order and stability. They ensure the smooth functioning of society through law enforcement, emergency response, dispute resolution, and other measures. This duty leads people to perceive authorities as having the ability to manage and resolve issues. However, views on the authority of authorities are also influenced by factors such as cultural history, political context, and personal experience. Different individuals and groups may have various opinions regarding the authority of authorities. Back to the story, <laughs> Chao Si had only ten fingers, while、well, Nai, as he had lost one. But Mr. X has too many places to relocate. He couldn't chop all his fingers off, right? So he suggested Mr. X to recruit a bunch of people to specifically deal with the demolitions and resettlements. You know, he proposed to industrialize the process of demolition and relocations. Mr. X then realized that Chao Si was quite smart, unlike his appearance. They then recruited a bunch of scum and villains in society, including fugitives at large, gangsters just out of prison, and street thugs looking for trouble. They utilized branding techniques, operating under the guise of Mr. X arrangement, and founded Harbin Longhua Construction Company. 
led by Chao Si, it was specifically responsible for the false eviction business. And I think that's why when I was little, people got different faces when they heard of construction companies even in the south of China. Now that you know the composition of this organization, you will expect they do no good. Their overall approach when dealing with households facing demolition is basically use strong measures against those who disagreed. If it didn't work, they resort to violence. Every time there's a confrontation, Chao Si is always at the forefront, leading the way. He delivered the first blow, fired the first shot, and acted swiftly and ruthlessly, without mercy. If the leader was so brazenly cruel, you can imagine how the rest of the gang members, who were desperate criminals, behaved. The very extreme cases were that made the holdouts to be disabled and literally pointed guns to their heads of those who were reluctant to sign the contracts for relocations. Therefore, this organization was truly unparalleled in this regard. At that time, Harbin was incredibly beautiful, earning the credit of being the pearl on the swan's neck. With its blue railings, golden towers, and exquisite red mansions, the streets were filled with distinctive European-style buildings, given Harbin's proximity to the border between China and Russia. However, these barbarians paid no attention to the intricately carved beams and painted pillars. Led by Chao Si, his gangs would mercilessly hammer away at these structures, reducing them to rubble. Whether it was a grand and magnificent century-old church or a dilapidated shanty, they treated them all the same tearing down windows and smashing walls without hesitation, turning the entire area into ruins. Chao Si's success didn't bring his own glory. It helped Mr. X to be promoted as well. Remember, we have mentioned that Mr. X couldn't get promotions at all as he couldn't kiss asses. Now he didn't need to kiss ass either to get promotions as the blocks and streets that were under his charge were relocated super duper fast compared to his colleagues. So now he charged not only a few streets, he oversaw the relocations of the whole city of Harbin. When Chao Si first met Mr. X, he only charged 10 yuan to manage the holdouts, but now he was not acting alone. So he approached to Mr. X and proposed an increase in the demolition compensation to a company to meet the settlement amount promised by the city government at the time. And of course, Mr. X wouldn't agree easily. He used excuses as budget management to refuse it. Well, Chao Si couldn't be too rude to Mr. X, right? He simply stated that he would abandon this whole matter if the increase in the settlement couldn't be fulfilled. Mr. X didn't give it an attention when Chao Si quitted, as he thought he was the real founder of this Longhua construction company. If it wasn't for him, this whole thing, whole business wouldn't happen at all, right? But when he tried to directly order the company to handle the, the, the demolition matters, he realized that nobody gave a shit about him. On one side, there was a politically pressing task that weighed heavily on him, and on the other side, there was an unresponsive, bureaucratic machine. Helpless in the situation, Mr. X had no choice but to approach Charles again and agree to pay them according to the government's standards for handling the demolition activities in his jurisdictions. Afterwards, Chao Si and his gang became even more reckless in their actions. Their treatment of holdouts was increasingly cruel, including but not limited to threats, causing disabilities, kidnappings, and so on. So, in the 1980s, when the average monthly salary was only tens of yuan, Chao Si, through demolitions, became a top tycoon in the city. In a single gambling session, he could throw over 400,000 yuan. When he had a singer perform in front of his barbecue stall, he could tip them over tens of thousands of yuan. Every time he dined out, he would exclusively book the finest top-tier restaurants in Harbin. Even when staying at hotels, 
He would make other guests pack up and leave, calamming the entire hotel for himself and his entourage. On one hand, he lived a lavish and extravagant lifestyle, spending money like water. On the other hand, he openly flaunted his style. Legends and rumors about Charles spread like wildfire, making him a household name in Harbin. However, Mr. X, being an educated individual, understood that throughout history, if he could cultivate one Charles, he could cultivate numerous others to counterbalance and confront him. Mr. X didn't need a dominant partner; he simply needed obedient and capable individuals like Charles to follow his orders. There were more and more so-called construction companies joined the game under Mr. X's instructions. The entire city's hooligans started wielding iron rods and shotguns, engaging in a battle of wits and courage with the holdouts. Charles wasn't a fool. He understood that by now, without Mr. X's instructions, other teams wouldn't be able to secure demolition work in his jurisdiction. This indicated that Mr. X was dissatisfied with him and wanted to restrain his power. What would he do? Chao Si couldn't directly approach Mr. X for a face-to-face -face discussion, as he understood that he aspired to become a king of Harbin's underground kingdom, and he also knew that Mr. X wouldn't want him to escape his control. So, in one of his operations. He ventured into another district to carry out a demolition, competing with another construction party for the project. Coincidentally, the other party also had a background in the underworld, and thus both sides engaged in a fierce battle. Chao Si, consumed by rage, pulled out a dagger and thrust it into the chest of the opposing faction's leader, causing severe bleeding. Before he could reach the hospital, the opponents succumbed. To his injuries on the way, Chao Si called Mr. X and told him that he killed someone. Mr. X didn't expect this at all. You know, he wanted to rise in the office only, didn't want to deal with murders. But by that time, Chao Si took that life of the opponent too, but already tied together for too long. If Chao Si was caught, he'd spit all out to the government, to Beijing, to his superiors. Mr. X had to carry up for him, otherwise he would fall with Charles for sure. But how? It's a life, and Mr. X wasn't a high-level officer at all when it comes to cover up the homicide. The homicide case was quickly registered and investigated by the Public Security Bureau. Mr. X began seeking connections while Charles prepared a substantial amount of cash. Both intended to bribe the captain of the criminal investigation team responsible for their case. However, to their surprise, this captain turned out to be an incorruptible figure. Not only did he possess his evidence related to the murder case involving the two individuals, but he also collected information on acts of false evictions, demolitions, and assaults leading to disabilities. He was determined. To solidify the charges of murder and involvement in organized crime against the both, Chao Si got panic. He wanted to kill this captain, but Mr. X knew it wouldn't end good as he was a cop, you know. So he changed his bribe target to the captain's superior. Thus, the vice deputy director in Harbin received a whole roast pig, and its belly was filled with cash. From then on, they became friends to this vice deputy director. As a result, whenever the police station had any needs, the two of them were always at the forefront. When the police station got a new office, Chao Si purchased all the desks and chairs for them. Recognizing the outdated equipment at the police station, Mr. X arranged for the acquisition of communication devices for all the law enforcement personnel. Even the gifts given to command outstanding police officers were provided by Chao Si and his associates. With these maneuvers, the case involving murder and organized crime was suppressed by this vice deputy director, the upright and uncompromising captain. Evidently, had no intention of letting this matter end there. 
He directly compiled the materials and sent them to the provincial authorities, requesting intervention from high-level power institutions. Soon, a task force was dispatched by the provincial headquarters. Mr. X and Charles had already tied the vice deputy director together, and the three of them decided to propose that Xiao Si assisted the Harbin police as an informant targeting and eradicating criminal gangs with organized crimes activities. This way, they could protect themselves while also presenting a solution to the local organized crime issue for the task force. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement. The level of corruption in the government at that time was truly staggering, leaving people in awe. It was only in the past decade that continuous efforts by the Beijing to combat corruption brought these shocking cases of collusion to light in front of the public. Harbin, the capital city of Heilongjiang province, covers an area of about 20,490 square miles. Harbin is one of the largest cities in China, with sub-earth and counties according for a high proportion of the total area. The urban area is relatively small, which is also one of the reasons why Harbin gives the impression of a provincial capital. The area of Harbin equivalent to 95% of areas of Colorado, USA, 90% of the area of Kansas, USA, half of the area of Indiana, USA, three times the area of Detroit metropolitan area, USA, 20 times the area of Greater London, UK, 94% of the area of Eastern England, UK, and from Macrochester Nut, the population of Harbin in between 1980 to 1990 was on average was this number. Too big for me to pronounce. That was not small in population either, as you can tell. So Chao Si, our main guy today, wouldn't be the only mafia or underground organization there. There were at least three mainstream mafias dominated Harbin back then. But remember that Chao Si was hired as an informant. Instead of scaling back, his manner of behavior had turned even more unceremoniously unconstrained. They had to dig a hole in the middle of the ice during winter time and put their opponent in it. The average temperature there during winter is about minus 16 Celsius degree. Therefore, the guy in the ice hole would have his whole body numbed. But they didn't stop there. They'd pull him up and stretch out his fingers on the ice for him and use gunstock to smudge each of them, one finger after the other until all of his fingers were disfigured and became muddy and bloody. Chao Si would then be satisfied and left. This is so fucking gross and cruel to even say it. But then you'd see how crazy and twisted this guy was. It's like he lost one of his fingers, he couldn't bear his opponents to have their fingers fold. And in another black shot between guns, Charles's guys shot a guy from the other party with guns that used knives to break his ankle tendons, disabled him for life. That's the way he dealt with the other mafias, though he wasn't too polite either with the authority. Even when he was taken in for questioning by the prosecutor, Chao Si, would be arrogant enough to threat to throw this prosecutor out of the window to the ground below. As when Charles stood out to manage these affairs, Mr. X would stay behind him and bribe the officers from the city level to the provincial. The vice deputy director also helped greatly to suppress dissenting voices. Like this unbribable captain above, who wanted to bring down Chao Si and Mr. X, right? He got kicked out of Harbin and had to leave from the local police system. Finally, at this point, Chao Si was basically occupied this whole relocating market. He was clean in the eye of the authorities and he was notorious even among the mafias. But on the other hand, the rise of Chao Si wasn't exactly what Mr. X wanted. Having helped breed a monster, 
He was frightened by what it had become and decided that it must be destroyed. As Charles had turned into a totally different person, no longer the poor kid he once was. Charles, with abundant financial resources, built an European-style 0.5 square miles villa on the northern bank of the Songhua River, reportedly costing 3.83 million Chinese yuan, and that was back in 1988, which was about 1 million USD in 1988. Well, I mean, wow! This villa, equipped with a ballroom, bathrooms, and deluxe guest rooms, was considered extremely luxurious at that time. Many individuals who had completed their prison sentences flocked to it. Chao Si generously provided shelter and even organized a grand wedding for a released inmate who had served 13 years, contributing 16,000 yuan towards this. Celebration. Since then, Charles wears suits and leather shoes, bantering and drinking with high officials, wealthy businessmen, all over Harbin. He seemed to be an incredible Gatsby. Don't look at it now that the villa has become abandoned like this. In those days, it was second to none in fame and luxury. Many high officials and dignitaries lingered there and unable to leave. Chao Si sent bribes indiscriminately and had complete control over both the underworld and the bureaucrats. It seemed that Mr. X could no longer restrain him. Chao Si joined Mr. X's lead back in 1983, and to 1990, only seven years later, he was different. From threatening holdouts to prosper leading an underworld crime syndicate, committing more than 130 crimes. Bribing hundreds of officials of all sizes, he became the de facto underworld mayor of Harbin. There were no fewer than ten thousand security guards and henchmen surrounding him. This underworld organization, disguised as a demolition company, has taken over the entire city of Harbin. Like we have said at the beginning, that Mr. X actually wanted the city got better. In his original thoughts. Instead of getting worse, like how it turned out to be with Chao Si, and there's one particular instance was the last straw that broke the camel's back. There was this dance hall in which Chao Si got again drunk and leaned against his bodyguard and walking out with his fellows. There was this random couple literally just walked past him, and that woman was pregnant for no reason. Chao Si suddenly swung a glass bottle of beer right to their heads. And he commanded them to kneel so he can kick them in their heads, like for no reason. They were literally random pedestrians, and it all happened in a public area, literally the whole of a ground floor entertainment venue. When Mr. X walked closer, and he saw clearly that Chao Si was kicking the belly of that pregnant woman. And her husband was bending on the ground and trying to see what was going on, but couldn't move as he was held by Charles's bodyguards. After all, Mr. X was a well-educated graduate from university, which was special in the past because various historical reasons. He had heard of cruel means Charles took to his opponents, but he had never witnessed such cruelty against the people of the citizen in person. Mr. X stepped in and stopped Charles's indescribable brutal acts. He sent the couple to the hospital. They survived, though their kid was gone, and the couple must have been waiting desperately for this kid to be born. The soon-to-be mother lost it the moment she knew her kid was gone. Mr. X knew that was it. He couldn't let Charles continue his heinous crimes. At this time, Mr. X finally recalled this captain who wanted to overthrow him and Charles years ago. The captain had been demoted and left Harbin at that time, but righteous people are difficult to be completely crushed by evil. In the years when Charles was above the law, he did not give up reporting and dealing with this underworld boss. So although captain was very surprised when Mr. X came to the door. After Mr. X confessed all the crimes he had committed with Charles over the years, 
the captain decided to join Mr. X to fight with Chao Si. Captain brought Mr. X to the home of the new Mayor Zhang. Mayor Zhang was not originated from Harbin, though. He was not happy with this whole situation of Chao Si and his gangs. Mr. Zhang was only a young and not important officer when he first visited Harbin. He was stunned by the level of corruption in Harbin. And back then, the captain was still a captain, so the two with similar ideas naturally became friends. Now then, Zhang became the mayor. With the help of Mr. X, they knew their chance of bringing down Chao Si, and these mafias was finally arrived. Mayor Zhang believed that Chao Si's criminal acts were almost known to everyone, from high officers in Harbin government to ordinary civilians. But most people chose to stay silent. The first step to overthrow Chao Si was for someone to speak up. Mr. X knew it had to be him. But in that case, he'd lose everything. He couldn't continue his dreams to better Harbin as an officer, and he'd be jailed for it for sure. In the worst situation, he'd be sentenced to death by the law. I guess he'd be struggled so badly as if he didn't speak up. He can continue as now it is, you know, had his job and wealth and basically everything. And if he reported it to Beijing. However, he turned himself in eventually. I bet he finally recorded the reason why he wanted to join the party and became an officer was to better his hometown, rather than to push it to the hearts of the devils. So, with half a year of preparation, they gathered all the evidence about Chao Si and his heinous crimes. Mayor Zhang brought Mr. X to the province and next to Beijing to expose it. It's seven years later, and the officers kept changing in the province systems. I bet, I bet even Charles couldn't bribe old continuously. That's the new mayor, and I guess they would be new lead officers for the provincial government as well. On the ninth of August, nineteen ninety, the Heilongjiang provincial government arranged an investigating team and a large number of armed police from other places to arrest. And they had made this action highly confidential, knowing the officers on the city level were bribed thoroughly by him. So, fifty regular police, forty armed police, and fifty special police—that's a hundred and forty police force—to spread into the city of Harbin looking for Chao Si. Side note: the special police in China is somewhat similar to SWAT in the U.S. and special branches in the U.K. They took over many of the dance halls, billiard balls, and illegal gambling dens. Chao Si was awakened by incoming phone calls telling him that his henchmen were caught. He didn't give a shit though, as he thought when the sun came out the next day, he could ring up his officer friends, and his crews would be released as usual. As he woke up the next day, he sent visiting request to the provincial investigating team. Yes, they wanted to make it confidential, though. Charles knew it. They were coming for him, and he even knew where they were based in the city of Harbin. Charles, accompanied by his luxurious car, parked at the bottom of the office of this investigating team. He entered the premises with an air of casual confidence. The staff of the investigation team were highly nervous. Some even discreetly resting their hands on their holstered guns. Chao Si appeared completely indifferent to the tense atmosphere, treating it as if we were of no concern. He nonchalantly took a seat, crossing his legs and even letting out a yawn, showing a complete state of relaxation. With a relaxed and mocking expression, Chao Si even offered cigars to the members of the investigation team. Casually remarking that he has nothing to do with the underworld, the relaxed and pleasant atmosphere finally shattered when Mr. X appeared, and it was that moment that Chao Si realized that this investigation team was unlike any before. He finally grasped the seriousness of the situation. On the ninth of June, nineteen ninety-one, the Intermediate People's Court of Harbin City publicly announced. The final verdict of the provincial high court regarding several cases involving gang organizations. 
the total of 47 criminals were convicted. Song Yongjia, the ringleader, along with 14 other criminals, were sentenced to death and their sentences were immediately carried out. One person received a suspended death sentence, one person received life imprisonment. 20 individuals were sentenced to five years or more of fixed term imprisonment, and 11 individuals were sentenced to less than five years of fixed term imprisonment, probation, or exempted from criminal punishment. Mr. X, for his meritorious reporting, was sentenced to life imprisonment. Other officials in the case were also subject to corresponding legal proceedings. Here is a clip when they were caught and escorted by the police. But they didn't provide a download option so I can't play it in my video. Hence, couldn't provide you with the English translation. Basically, judging from the video, no one in this gang was afraid of the death or anything. Many members, including Chao Si, even put on smiles when they were announced their sentence. As if they were feeling proud even to their last moment of life. Song Yongjia died on the 9th of June 1991, 43 years old. Marks the end of Chao Si Do. Not all his gang members were caught. There's this hitman, Li Zhengguang, escaped the search. As you can see the map here, the Heilongjiang province is very close to the Koreas. So many of these gang members were ethnic Koreans. Despite Chao Si and his major gang members were caught, some of his or other gang members left and somehow got to the South Korea. This movie Outlaws is based on the Kosapa incident, which originated in South Korea. This incident was a series of cases caused by Chinese gang members illegally crossing into South Korea. It is said that these Chinese gang members were supposedly from the remaining members of this Chao Si's gang who successfully escaped. As they were wanted in China, they couldn't use their real names even in the South Korea. Anyway, Li Zhongguang was said to be in South Korea for a while and then returned to Beijing and became a businessman. But he got arrested in Beijing and was executed in 2003. His story isn't short and full on violent. I wouldn't cover his story in this video though. I am hesitated to make even a video about him. As if I were to tell his story, I can't skip the cruel parts on him and I am having enough of cruelty in today's video for quite a long time. There are numerous stories about Chao Si and his gangs and how they had behaved in the past. However, when people spread these stories, they not only emphasize the brutality but also depict the so-called glory of the gang at that time. It was a robbery built upon the suffering of the people of Harbin. It is worth nothing that these so-called gang activities can indeed have an influence on young people. The influence and harm caused by idolizing the underworld on adolescents is an important topic. Adolescents are particularly susceptible to the harm and influence of idolizing the underworld for several reasons. Firstly, during this stage, they are in the process of identity formation and self-exploration. They yearn to find their own identity and belongings. The underworld may be seen as a symbol of alternative, rebellious and powerful identity, attracting them to seek a sense of belongings by draining. Secondly, adolescents often deserve power and status aspiring to achieve recognition and respect in society. The underworld is perceived as a group that possesses power and status. Some adults mistakenly believe that associating with the underworld will grant them with this privilege. Thirdly, peer pressure and influence play a significant role in adolescents. And when their peers adults and admire the underworld, Adolescents may attempt to imitate their behavior to gain social acceptance. Moreover, media and cultural depictions of the underworld can also have an impact. Movies, TV shows, and music often portray gangster characters as charismatic and heroic, leading adolescents to wield them as role models. Additionally, 
family environment, and social background contribute to the susceptibility of adolescents to negative influence. Lack of possible family support, limited access to educational resource, and social marginalization make them more prone to falling under negative influences. It is important to know that although adolescents are vulnerable to negative influences, they still possess the ability to think independently and make choices. To steer them away from negative influences, it is crucial to provide positive guidance, education, and support, fostering their self-confidence, social skills, and cultivation of proper values. Moreover, the nature of the underworld in China, at least based on my understanding of the culture, is incredibly complex. It is not just a simple violent collective, but involves intricate elements such as disputes over interests, political and business corruptions, and so on. Furthermore, if it weren't for the intervention of high-ranking politicians, the criminal group led by Chelsea in today's story might not have met its. Demise. They could have continued to evade justice even hiding in countries without extradition agreements with China. In that case, they could have luxurious enjoyed the wealth acquired through illicit means without facing legal consequences. Good thing that never happened. I hope you can grasp what I'm getting at here. I'm creating a semi-fictitious character in today's story, Mr. X. See, the thing is, the official case files won't spill the beans on the specific official involved, and without them, many of these events that happened in reality just can't unfold in the same way. So I'm left to rely on my superficial knowledge of Chinese society and come up with this notion that this Mr. X character is a necessary presence. I hope you catch my drift. Even though I'd love to spill all the beans and tackle a bunch of questions, it's better not to voice my own speculations. I don't want to mislead anyone and make them think it's all a done deal. Handling social cases in China is a tough nut to crack, and discussions often get stuck on the surface without diving deeper. After all, I don't know where the line is drawn in terms of what the authorities tolerate, and I sure don't want to cross any forbidden boundaries. Now I know it may sound like I am intentionally trying to stir up some panic, but trust me, that's not my intention. I am not, and never will be, discussing any political issues concerning any country. Although let's face it, many social cases do involve political factors. Anyway, I hope you get where I am coming from, and it would be great if you could give me a thumbs up. And stay tuned for more videos from me. Bye.